Welcome everyone to today's talk, which is about data informed transformation improving performance of Agile team using static analysis by Naresh and Triram. Without further delay, over to you, Naresh and Triram. Great to see all the familiar names. Unfortunately, we can't see your faces, but uh, we can see the names and uh, good to see all of you. Thanks for joining in. Uh, this is going to be a 60 minute session. Uh, so Sriram and I have been uh, partnering at uh, a client and uh, you know some of this will be based off that and some of this is based on the previous experiences we've had. So we'll kind of try and hit all the key lessons so that it is useful for folks uh, in, in, in the journey that we've gone through. Uh, and it's still an ongoing journey. We've not uh, arrived at the destination. And I don't think there is a thing called destination in this <laughs> evolving world. Uh, let me quickly share my slides and get started here. All right. Uh, we also want to thank uh, Rakesh, uh, who uh, I do see in the audience, but uh, Rakesh has been an uh, instrumental part of uh, helping uh, this work. So it is kind of a joint presentation between uh, Sriram, Rakesh, and myself. Sriram, you want to say a couple of words about yourself? Uh, sure. Am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, hello everybody. Um, I for the last one year or so, I, I have been an independent consultant. But uh, prior to that, I I was with uh, ThoughtWorks for a long time. And when I quit ThoughtWorks, I was a, a VP of uh, Transformation Advisory, uh, advising clients on uh, improving the performance of their organizations in the context of. Uh, digital transformation but uh, along the topics of uh, you know topics of moving from projects to products organization design uh, metrics and those kind of things so there's quite a bit of uh, variety in the kind of consulting i do and this particular engagement uh, you know i've been uh, working with naresh and rakesh for the last several months uh, it has gone through you know it has evolved the work has evolved and um, Yes, the, here the context is more around um, uh, software delivery, uh, you know, a very um, like a data data informed look at software delivery and trying to extract patterns out of that data and then use that to inform the future of the transformation efforts. So uh, I've enjoyed this journey so far and I'm excited to, to be sharing our experience so far with all of you. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, uh, Sriram, for that introduction. Let's uh, dive in straight into the topic. Uh, we've broken this uh, broadly into three, uh, you know, three sections. The first one, we would set some background in the context of what we're trying to do. Then we'll look at some analysis that was actually done and what were the challenges we faced. And then finally, we'll get into some lessons learned that, uh, you know, when we applied actual analysis, uh, what did we learn from it? And maybe some of the lessons that uh, other folks can apply in their own context. So generally, when we talk about uh, improving performance uh, of uh, organizations, uh, specifically from a delivery, uh, or software delivery perspective, uh, you know, CXOs would typically talk about, hey, I want uh, faster delivery, I want more reliable delivery, I want frictionless delivery, which means I want things to seamlessly flow through in the organization and not uh, you know, keep getting stuck and, you know, things like that. And so when we look at the common performance improvement objectives, uh, you know, they, they may be like these three at the top level for a lot of uh, organizations. Uh, and we kind of in this presentation, we'll, we'll like break it down a little bit and kind of uh, get into, uh, you know, a few more next levels inside this and how do we then use data to uh, make informed decisions around improving uh, or introducing interventions in, in, in as part of the transformation. Uh, again, just a disclaimer here that uh, this is, uh, you know, this is for folks involved in a large scale software delivery, uh, 
Uh, I think in our case, we are looking at upwards of 40,000 uh, engineers working on things. Uh, and so it's a fairly large scale software delivery uh, effort here. Uh, and uh, the I think Sriram had a talk earlier today where he talked about basically uh, the impact on business outcomes and uh, things like that. So uh, in this particular talk, we've uh, intentionally not gonna focus on the business outcome side of things, but purely on the software engineering and delivery side of things, uh, which also I think is a very important area uh, that needs to be dealt into. So, you know, if you've missed Sri Ram's earlier talk, it will be recorded available. You can have a look at that. Uh, with that, I think uh, just quickly jumping in, uh, most of you might be uh, either driving some kind of transformation or involved in some kind of a transformation. That is why I'm hoping you're uh, part of this session or you've joined this session. And the typical kind of interventions that uh, one may do when, when you go into an organization uh, or you're trying to basically, uh, you know, transform a, a team uh, you know you might look at introducing certain practices like scrum scrum of scrums uh, pi planning uh, you know several other technical practices listed over here uh, so you have like a menu full of uh, practices at your disposal that you could use as uh, ways to uh, you know influence teams and kind of try and introduce some uh, interventions in the ways of working that they have uh the uh you know the, the the question that we asked ourselves is that how do we know uh what uh, uh you know what teams could benefit uh you know from these kinds of interventions right uh how do we kind of figure that out uh usually you know we just expect that everyone will adopt everything and uh, we will assign some kind of fluency or some kind of maturity rating to the teams and uh, basically get them to check off the boxes go through a series of training etc cetera, etc cetera. and like that unfortunately is the state of transformation in a lot of places uh, and I think that's a little bit of a disservice in my opinion, uh, because if we don't really have data to back what we are doing and we're not using that as a way to drive certain things, we could just be very, uh, uh, what's the word, very, uh, you know, uh, we we could just like be very prescriptive about it and we could have this uh, attitude of one size fits all uh, but we all know that you know the very essence of agile is that uh, you know one size does not fit all uh, each team has its uh, context and things have to be uh, you know as per their specific context and I've, i think we've heard this from andy's talk uh, yesterday as well uh, and so uh, what happens is typically people start off and then at some point the CXOs will wake up and they will ask, hey, you know, uh, has the, uh, we originally started with, uh, you know, uh, faster delivery or more reliable delivery or friction less, has this transformation uh, helped us achieve this? Uh, and and people feel like they're caught off guard when, when such questions are asked uh, or maybe, you know, even people question how do you even uh, quantify uh, things like this because it's a transformation and so forth, right? So we want to uh, kind of deep dive a little bit into it in terms of how teams could actually uh, approach this and how uh, they could show to the CXOs that the transformation are in fact uh, helping achieve the objectives that they are trying to drive from a software delivery perspective. Uh, of course, uh, you know, you require analysis and you need to deep dive uh, to be able to do this. But before we jump in, right, let me kind of quickly step back a little bit and just look at uh, what what I would say is the, uh, you know, your overall, uh, you know, from idea to uh, cash or idea to go live, right? Uh, if you look at the overall thing, that's kind of what we call as the lead time, right? And, and basically from idea to cash, uh, various stages which would have uh, you know uh, some activity some uh, some uh, work centers and then some uh, wait stages in between right so typically you could visualize this but the one that we are specifically interested in this particular talk is this uh, little blue uh, or whatever this color is uh, development box uh, so let's zoom in into uh, into that a little bit 
uh, and 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 basically see what that is. But also, uh, you know, I know a lot of you might be thinking, hey, this is you know, agile software development is not like a linear waterfall kind of a model. It should be iterative. Like these are all intermixed, and there are feedback loops going back and forth, uh, which is absolutely right, and that's that's how it should be. But uh, anyone who's worked in large uh, you know, uh, software delivery organizations will realize that, unfortunately, it's it it effectively ends up being linear, uh, not necessarily uh, as iterative as you would like, right? So now, if we kind of zoom in a little bit, and then we'll define a couple of uh, more uh, terminologies here, just so we are all on the same page. Is if you zoom into the development thing, you will see that uh, you know there is some amount of discovery that needs to happen. Then solutioning happens. Then you do your uh, planning. Then the actual development and in sprint automation, and then you would have things like uh, you know integration testing and other kinds of uh, chaos testing and re reliability testing, and finally you have to wait to get into production, right? Uh, so that, that's the that, that's the area that we're gonna double click today. And so this entire cycle is what we would call as, or anybody would call as the delivery lead time from the discovery to actually up to going live. And even within that, if you further zoom in, it's basically once the dev teams uh, are done, right? Once the developers are done, till the time it actually goes uh, live is what we call as the change lead time. Again, for folks who've uh, read Dora reports uh, will be familiar with this term CLT or change lead time. And that's kind of the area we, we wanna further zoom in today and look at it. Uh, but you know, the, the question we have is, you know, have these times improved by our interventions? And if they are improved, then uh, can, he, can we quantify by how much uh, you know has those improvements happened? That's the kind of question that we want to answer and be able to answer to uh, the CXOs so they understand that the investment they are making in terms of the transformation is actually uh, a fruitful, a, a, a reasonable ROI for them. Uh, so let's first look at the question number one, right? Has these times improved and by how much? Uh, to be able to answer this question, we, we have two prerequisites. Uh, the first prerequisite is basically we need to be able to establish a baseline or some kind of historical data against which you would be able to compare and say whether it's improved or not. And if it's improved by how much it is improved. And also when we are doing this, we should be aware that we need to do a like-to-like -like comparison or like-for-like -like comparison, right? What do I mean by that? Is let's uh, take uh, CLT, for example, the change lead time that we were talking. Uh, if you had a certain feature uh, and you could uh, measure the CLT for that, then you could say, hey, the CLT is dependent on uh, the size of the feature, right? Because different sizes of features may require different uh, amount of CLT. It may depend on in what kind of release train or release bundle it's actually getting uh, shipped out, uh, how many bugs were found, how much uh, the testing time went in and once bugs were found, how much effort went in from the dev point of view. So you might say, hey, here are a few of the factors that influence the CLT. Uh, and now I want to compare two features, uh, maybe three months apart, right? So if you just compare the two features as is uh, without looking at some of these factors in terms of size and in terms of uh, the bugs and so forth, then it may not be a like for like comparison, right? So you probably need to normalize the CLT. Uh, again, I've just given a simple formula here, but it could be uh, something more complicated. But uh, the point here that we're trying to make is uh, these are the prerequisites. These are the things one needs to think about, uh, you know, while trying to answer the first question, uh, which is have these uh, you know, the time, the CLT times and the delivery lead times, have they actually improved? Uh, you know, you should be able to establish a baseline or you need to establish a baseline and you need to have a like for like comparison. I'll uh, jump ahead a little bit and I will talk about the second question, which is, I think, uh, even more interesting as you get into it, right? how much uh, of the reduction is due to the intervention that we are doing, right? Like uh, you might be introducing a set of practices and you might want to say, okay, by introducing these practices, how much have I uh, reduced the change lead time? Uh, and sometimes that number does not move as quickly as you would like, right? It, it sometimes takes time. 
So you might say, okay, let me kind of decompose that a little bit into uh, and try and understand what all uh, actually uh, you know does entail uh, for a CLT to be a certain number, right? And then you might say, hey, you know, the amount of time it takes for integration testing to happen is is one factor that goes in, right? The amount of time it takes to fix the bugs, the amount of time it takes for actually deploying your changes, and the amount of waiting in in all this process, right? This is where the friction piece that we were talking earlier comes in. So you might say, hey, I need to uh, be able to look at all of these areas to be a uh, to to understand how the CLT is getting impacted. Now, as you start breaking this down, one of the things you will realize is that, uh, you know, then these guys are then further dependent on a uh, few more attributes, right, or a few more factors. And you slowly start seeing uh, a kind of a contribution tree uh, building out from here, right, which is basically change lead is dependent on some things and those things are then further dependent on. So if you take the integration testing time, uh, one of the factors that will influence the integration testing time is the the size of the feature, uh, the extent of automation, test automation that you have currently, right? How available and productive are the testers to work on that particular features testing uh, and so forth. Again, this is not a exhaustive list. In fact, we have a much larger uh, list of things that can influence and in the contribution tree. Uh, this is just uh, pre presented, a subset of it is presented here just so you understand the uh, concept, right? And then when you start looking at each of these, you could think of like, hey, I can uh, I can introduce, I can I I, I can do certain things uh, to improve uh, these things, right? So you could you could say, hey, I I I need to have an initiative to shift left things, uh, or I need to invest more in terms of test automation. I need to hire and upskill people. I need to reduce my batch size and so forth, right? Or invest in better test environment, fully automated ephemeral environments, et cetera, et cetera. So you could start saying, okay, I, I can, uh, you know, further, uh, you know, introduce these kinds of concepts into the organization to improve some of these factors that influence the CLT. And you could then think of specific practices or techniques uh, that could help uh, with this, right? Like, for example, if feature size is a factor, we can we all know that you know we we, we would like to introduce feature slicing. Uh, you know, from a shift left point of view, of course, continuous integration is important, but you might also want to do contract testing. You might want to do other kinds of things uh, to reduce the batch size. You may also want to introduce practices like independent deployment. I think uh, Nilesh and I spoke uh, earlier today uh, about uh, how we're using Feature Hub uh, as, as ways to uh, influence uh, independent deployment and so forth, right? So you, you, you can then add the last layer of this uh, a contribution tree in terms of uh, several practices that you could introduce uh, to to influence this right uh, so far i am ho i hope everyone's with me in terms of how you start uh, thinking about uh, any kind of a metric and breaking it down into its contribution tree then of course the question is how much of improvement is due to our intervention right and perhaps more importantly it's not while understanding the historical data and understanding what has been influencing what is the relationship between these things and for this particular organization and for this particular team uh, what factors play more weightage have a more weightage than something else would be important to understand but I would argue that, uh, you know, it would be even more important. The whole reason you're trying to do this is you want to figure out in future, where should you invest? Where should you focus, right? What is going to give you the biggest bang for the buck? So you want to know, uh, you know, what should be your focus areas in the future based on this data and based on this analysis, right? Like this is kind of where uh, at least... Uh, we were headed and we were trying to figure out uh, these questions. Uh, and unfortunately, this is not a, uh, there's no silver bullet answer here. There is no uh, simple follow the book kind of a recipe, unfortunately, uh, in this space. So this is where I think we turn to uh, statistical measures and uh, statistical methods. And I'd uh, request now Sriram to quickly take over and uh, walk us through this part of the journey. Thank you, Naresh. Let me just bring up my screen and 
turn off this floating controls. Is this uh, is this visible, Naresh? Yes, all good. All good. Okay. Um, so yes, what we saw is that there are multiple factors that contribute to the uh, to the metrics that matter at the top of the tree. And because there are multiple factors, you know, uh, there's potential to use some statistics to understand the contribution of those factors. Of course, that requires data. And most likely, if you are a large scale, uh, you know, if you're a large scale software setup, most likely you're using something like Jira, Azure DevOps, or something like that. And so that becomes the source of data. And uh, you know, when you're doing statistical analysis, you need enough data points, right? So uh, per, per team or per portfolio, if you're trying to do this, you need at least, I would say at least 100 data points. So, and let's say, let's say you have that data, right? Or you can obtain that data because I think this kind of data, it's reasonable to expect that you can obtain it from your systems, right? Like how long did it take after it was marked as development complete from that time how long did it take to go live what was the uh, feature size you basically total the points of all the stories in that feature uh you know in whichever bundle it was released what was the bundle size of that so you know if one feature was released independently then that's a bundle size of one if multiple were released together in one bundle then you will have a bundle size greater than one uh, how many bugs were reported in the in, in after the sprint after the development complete stage so during integration testing or other kinds of testing the later stages of testing and how long how much how long did it take like how many test testing days were required to perform that kind of testing and how many developer days were required to fix the bugs that were reported right so uh, if you i think this is i mean again i and this might not be readily available from your systems but with some amount of uh, you know custom reporting and uh, data manipulation uh, you should be able to arrive at this picture so once you have this picture what's next then we can run a uh, statistical analysis in particular that's called as a multiple regression analysis now, unfortunately, given the nature of this talk, uh, we we expect uh, you to have some knowledge of uh, statistics. Uh, we you know we don't have the time here to give uh, to explain what all these analyses mean. So you know, so we are not. Uh, uh, this is not a, like a statistics tutorial. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping that at least some of you will have uh, some familiarity with this kind of analysis. So. Basically, what we do over there is we identify the what is the what is a dependent variable, which is CLT, is a variable that is dependent on one or more of these factors, right? We don't know exactly how they are dependent in the case of our teams, but logically, using our experience and our you know knowledge of software delivery, we know that the time it takes uh, from development complete to go live would depend on you know the size of the feature the size of the bundle the number of bugs that were found and the effort it took to to test and uh, develop right there is some relationships between these variables itself and we will come to that later as long as the relationship is not too strong we can still model them as independent variables and so you know before we get to the results of the analysis we need to uh, ensure what what do we need to ensure to do a proper analysis uh, one is we have to normalize all the variables so all the data ranges they have to be normalized within the same range so that when you get the output of the regression the coefficients are comparable and we have to make sure that there is uh, that there is no multi collinearity between the independent variables that we are modeling that is the sort of uh, preparation stage once you run the analysis we have to validate that uh, you know before we can interpret the results we have to validate that uh, it is uh, it is meaningful and for that we use uh, two measures primarily uh, the p values and the adjusted r square in case of multiple regression it's called so referred to as statistical significance and explanatory power that is one part 
secondly we also run some predictions and uh, you know before that we actually split our data set into a training data set and a test data set and we kind of develop the model on the training data set and we uh, we we run the we, we also run it as in prediction mode on the training data set and we observe what the prediction errors are then we run the prediction afresh on the test data set and again we observe what the errors are and we make sure that the errors are small and similar in both the cases right so if you do all this you can be reasonably sure that the analysis is on um, firm ground right that that it is now worth interpreting so after do when you do all this you might sometimes find that uh, you know if the if the statistical significance itself is not there the p values itself are not great then of course then uh, it kind of throws the whole analysis into question but sometimes you know because we are using our expertise we are not just uh, trying to correlate random variables right we know that these variables influence clt so it might often happen that you get good scores for statistical significance but uh, your model might have poor explanatory power as in the adjusted r square values might be on the uh, you know might not be great so something like 85.85 is considered good right uh, but you might have much lower than that and that if that happens that indicates that maybe there are other factors that influence cld which we have not taken into account so a, a typical example of these other factors is wait time so mo in most organizations the way you set up your jira or azure devops does not allow you to measure wait time does not allow you to figure out what the wait time was and therefore it's unless you make changes to your workflows uh, you know wait time is sometimes not available and although it might be a significant factor that influences the cld another thing is you know so far we are assuming all features are more or less the same except for their size and you know number of bugs and so on but it it could be that the different domains features in one domain take much longer to to release than features in another domain right that might be the case um we are factoring you know the development time test time spent on a feature uh but all developers and testers are not the same right you might have inexperienced developers and experienced developers and testers and so on skilled developers less skilled developers and so on so we are not really factoring their competence into this model because the data again the data is not readily available but if your result has if you come up with a poor result with poor explanatory power then you might want to consider rerunning the analysis after incorporating these additional variables into the model so let's say we did all that we got a, a meaningful result and let's say the you know the usually a multiple regression will throw up a, a multiple linear regression will throw up a result like this where it will say that you know uh, clt is uh, actually i missed the intercept here so there will be some constant plus a few variables minus a few variables right so plus means like as feature size goes up change lead time goes up as bundle size goes up change lead time goes up and so on and minus means as the number of uh, testers increases or the amount of testing effort increases uh CLT goes down, or as the number of developers increase. Actually, uh, I've made a mistake in this thing. Uh, this, um, you know, is not test days. If it's test days, it's a plus, but it should actually be number of testers. So, you know, so I think of this as number of testers. If you have more testers, then the CLT will go down, right? Um, so that yeah that is roughly how you interpret the positive and negative signs and then the coefficients because you've normalized the data ranges to begin with you the coefficients are now comparable and th what this equation says is that for the data ranges in the analysis the highest coefficients numerically highest ignore the sign but the highest coefficients have the greatest influence on the clt right so in this case the three greatest influencers are bundle size uh number of developers and feature size um yeah because that has a uh, you know 8.6 5.5 and 4 4.6 so that is what this indicates so what it means is that if you want to reduce clt 
maybe you should focus on these three factors because these three factors have the highest coefficients, right? So they are they have the greatest influence on CLD. Yeah. Um, now in this particular case, you know, it's uh, uh, the first is eight uh, bundle size, second is number of developers, third is feature size, right? Out of this, not everything, increasing number of developers is potentially a management decision or a staffing decision, right? Whereas introducing practices that will reduce feature size or that will reduce bundle size is not a, not a not necessarily a management decision you know you are, if the principal engineers on the team or you know senior technical people can can take this call and try to do something about it and therefore this gives us the answer if you see basically if it says okay the most in our control what is in our control is say bundle size and feature size then you can go back to this map and say okay so which practice influences bundle size? Okay, that's independent deployment, right? And which factor influences feature size? Okay, there is a, a, we can do something like feature slicing, right? And that is how we come to know that, you know, for the for the data and the investigation, right? That you know, if it if it belongs to a particular team or a particular portfolio, then we can say that that team or that portfolio uh, will most likely get the greatest benefit from these sort of interventions right so that is that is how you know the statistical analysis helping up come with the uh, come up with the answer of what we should focus on in the future but it is a pre in a way it's a prediction it's a prediction based on the uh, past data of course you've run the model on the past data so it's telling at least the, that is what the past is telling you right um, but we can verify that once we adopt this uh, recommendation and we actually, you know, uh, introduce these practices into the teams, then if those practices are really making an effect, then they should have a trickle up effect on the top of the tree, right? So if this is having an effect, then everything else constant, integration test time should go down. Similarly, if this is having an effect and everything else constant, wait time should go down, right? So again, after a few months, we can, we can see, did test integration test time, wait time decrease for comparable features. Right. When I say comparable features, just like what Naresh said earlier, you will need some sort of a norm normalization uh, activity to make them comparable. But once you do that, we can we can answer this question. Did it reduce? And similarly, if they reduced, then how much as, as a result of them reducing, what was the effect at this level? Right. How much did that help improve CLT? That is how we verify, verify, you know, the uh, the result of our actions and our actions themselves were based on the result of the regression analysis. So what we've seen essentially is a, a data informed transformation loop. Like you might have come across uh, build, measure, learn as the, as the loop to build products, right? Like you build something, you measure its uh, effect with users or in the market and then you learn and then you that informs your next round of building functionality right now when you're talking about transformation initiatives you're not building something in a transformation but what you're doing is you're uh, designing interventions you're saying maybe we should adopt this practice maybe we should use this technique and so on and they are interventions but you could use the same you know data informed approach to transformation where it's like you intervene a little, you measure the results of the intervention, and then you learn about that. And that helps you decide your next round of interventions, right? And ideally, before you begin this whole process, you might want to baseline, like in the, the metrics that you are interested in, CLT, delivery lead time, uh, you know, reliability, and so on. You might want to baseline them and, and then start inter interven in, uh, designing interventions and then keep, keep executing uh, iterations you know maybe quarterly iterations of this loop or yeah because transformation efforts typically they uh, you know you, weekly iterations may be unrealistic but maybe quarterly iterations six monthly iterations that kind of because you need time for the data to accumulate and then make inferences from that data so this was the you know sample analysis now we'll get into the actual analysis you know what, what we actually did for a uh, for a client and for that again i'll um, oh okay um, yeah for for the next few slides i'm going to ask uh, naresh to come in and talk about 
we did not begin with statistics. We began with a Excel based um, analysis and I'll uh, let Nare speak about um, the first part of this. Cool. Thanks, Sriram. Uh, just before we jump in, I see there is one question. Uh, we'll probably just quickly make sure that we've answered that uh, before we move ahead. So there is a question uh, from Shravanan. Uh, he's asking, while we logically know the CLT contributing factors, how do we know the identified contributors is really contributing to CLT or not? I think that's kind of maybe, uh, you know, you might have asked this slightly before, uh, and that's kind of what Sriram actually went through and explained. Uh, so hopefully, Shravanan, that is actually covered. Uh, if not, uh, please let us know and we will uh, maybe circle back. All right. So just wanted to make sure that we've uh, addressed that piece. Yes. Okay, cool. Please confirm that it is. So cool. Unfortunately, we can't see you, but we can <laughs> still get that feedback. All right, perfect. So, uh, you know, in the, the frugal innovation thought process, right? Like you, you want to start with the simplest possible thing. And uh, of course, a lot of people will look down saying, gee, you're using Excel or whatever, but I think it's actually a pretty powerful uh, tool and it can give you a lot of insights and you can actually iterate on it quite a lot before you decide uh, what you might want to uh, deep dive in, right? So in our case, we basically said, hey, we, we want to understand essentially the uh, impact of CLT, uh, you know, month on month, uh, how is the CLT doing? And uh, how does it compare to the feature counts, right? The, like the feature velocity, if you will, uh, that is being completed. So what we started doing is we basically started plotting this data out in, uh, you know, using simple Excel. And uh, we started looking at basically month on month, what does our CLT look like? And essentially, uh, you know, how does that compare to the features and is there any correlation between the two? Uh, and, uh, you know, what are the trends looking like? Unfortunately, uh, like you can see from the graph, there is no, uh, we, at least we couldn't see a direct pattern. Uh, one of the thought process was basically as the feature count increases, uh, CLT will also increase uh, was was kind of one of the assessment we uh, or at least hypothesis that we had, but uh, the data did not hundred uh, percent concur to that, and we we had a lot of uh, things uh, that were not matching that. So we wanted to get a little bit more deeper and try and understand uh, what is going on. So if we quickly move to the next slide. Uh, what we what we try to do is two things here. One is we basically took for each month, we uh, instead of just looking at the CLT as a whole number, we started breaking it down into what are all the various components uh, that contribute to that CLT, right? Like basically the dev time, the waiting time, the SIT time, etc. right? Started breaking those and we wanted to see if there was any uh, correlation between them. Uh, the other thing also we try to do is instead of looking at it as an absolute number, we basically started looking at it from a percentage point of view. So relatively, we wanted to see if certain uh, phase is actually leading to a, a larger contribution. And what we quickly realized is when you're trying to do these month on month analysis, especially for something like this, where your CLT itself is much longer than, than any given month, you will have uh, the carryover effects and you will have other kinds of things where uh, something would have a delayed effect showing at a later point in time and vice versa. Uh, and so you can't really come up with any clear conclusions uh, basis this. And so we decided that uh, this month on month view of looking at uh, data is actually not a very, uh, is not a right way to do this. And so if we move to the next slide, we kind of then uh, pivoted a little bit to instead of, now you'll see here in the bottom, uh, these are basically feature IDs. So we are looking at for a given feature, what are all the basic uh, contributors to to CLT, and essentially, what is the uh, uh, you know like, uh, and then we started laying over like a couple of uh, you know influences that we thought, for example, feature size, uh, right, or uh, things like uh, bundle size, and uh, what we did see in some cases the the orange is the basically sit uh, you know the the time it takes in testing uh, right in sit 
or the yellow one that you will see is actually the time it takes for testing in uh, a replica environment or uh, you know staging environment and what we could see is in a few cases at least the if the size of the feature was big then uh, essentially the time, uh, the testing time, either the SIT time or the replica time put together, that was was a, a big number, but that was a big portion of the CLT. Uh, so we, that this sounded very promising to us. We said, okay, this is great, right? And uh, what we tried to do is we said, hey, but we also know that just uh, feature size is not the only contributor. There are other contributors. So let's start overlaying all those contributors uh, onto this and see if we can easily find some patterns, right? And hooray, you know, then we have the answer. Uh, unfortunately, when we started doing that, uh, things were things became very fuzzy. Things were no longer as simplistic as saying, okay, if the feature size is big, then the testing time is more. Uh, and as experts, you can obviously, you know, relate to that and say, yes, this makes sense. So our data is in fact, uh, you know, adhering to our mental model of things. But as you started laying more data, uh, more influences, uh, those correlations didn't really hold up, right? And it started becoming too complicated for us to, uh, you know, drive this. And this is the point where I think, uh, again, Sriram, me and Rakesh said, well, uh, you know, we, we have outlived uh, uh, the, 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 what we could do with Excel. And at this point, we need to turn to a little bit more uh, statistical tools like R or things like that. And uh, I, again, I'll kind of quickly pass it back to Sriram to uh, you know, narrate the story from here, what happened. Yeah, thank you, Naresh. So the next iteration, you know, we, we started with, uh, with uh, statistical analysis. So uh, we basically had uh, relatively speaking good quality data for uh, these three variables right we did not uh, they we did not directly have feature size uh, in points or whatever but we had a proxy metric for that and then we had bug count and we had bundle size so we said like you know C clt is a function of these three variables let's let's uh, do an analysis and see how it holds up right so we we split the data into three portfolios uh, because like I said, it's a large scale setup and there were different lines of businesses. So here every portfolio corresponds to one line of business. So when we split it up, then, you know, in out of in two out of three portfolios, we found that the regression result could explain about 60% of the variation in CLT, which uh, in other words, the adjusted R square was about 0 0.6. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, that's not great, but that's not uh, disappointing either, right? It, it just means that uh, there are still some more uh, some more variables that influence CLT. And so we need uh, that. So for our next iteration, we want, we, we want to have uh, data on um, the actual development days and test days. And for that, we are we are in talks with their uh, with the team that, uh, you know, manages their processes and tools to introduce uh, to um, use um, the capacity management module in azure devops and also maybe do some lightweight uh, time logging of the actual time it took on on different features right uh, i know that's not great but here is the sort of a, ideally we want to minimize manual data entry right we, uh, but but on the other hand if you want to have sustained budget for your transformation efforts then at some point you're going to have to show the show the demonstrate results and if you want to demonstrate results in a you know in a somewhat rigorous manner then you have to do all this and for this you need the data and where will the data come from sometimes you can just through through the actions of people the data is uh, generatable but other times you have to ask for a little bit of data entry discipline right so that's what uh, you know uh, we are going to do as the next iteration but even so far in whatever we have done so far um, there we have faced quite a few challenges and lessons learned in the areas of uh, data extraction data availability and data quality and jointly you know i've been uh, thinking and writing about this uh, topic in other contexts as well jointly all these uh, challenges uh, they are all in some ways they are all measurement challenges the ability to you know uh, measure things and 
they contribute to measurement debt, which is uh, similar to technical debt or tech debt, if you have heard of it, right? So you know that tech debt uh, slows things down, right? And uh, it basically reduces the rate of change and uh, it co makes code uh, less maintainable and so on. It has all those negative effects, right? Similarly, measurement debt has negative effects. Measurement debt means you can't measure the result of what you're doing and therefore you can't learn from it, right? Um, but but it is very common as co this is probably even more common than tech debt in most organizations and so to to if i want to define it a little bit formally i would say that you know, an organization takes on measurement debt when it implements initiatives any kind of initiative change initiative or a you know a, a new product or a new set of features for a product whatever it is it's an investment it represents an investment so they are investing in the initiative, but they are not investing in the measurement infrastructure that is required in order to validate the benefits to be delivered, you know, that, that will be delivered by those initiatives, right? So uh, if this happens, then you're taking on measurement. Right? And so in our case, in our case, you know, what is the initiative that we're talking about? It's basically the, um, I'll, I'll maybe give you a second to think about this, right? Uh, we're talking about like if, if you invest in a, some kind of initiative, whether it's a technology initiative or in this context, it's a transformation initiative, right? You're still investing in it. You're maybe hiring some coaches, uh, you know, maybe you're, you're, you know, investing in some tooling and so on. They represent investments. So investing in a transformation initiative, but if you don't have the corresponding measurement infrastructure to validate if it is making a difference, then you're basically shooting blind. And that is the state in, in many organizations, a transformation is a article of faith. We say, oh, we are doing stand-ups, we are doing CICD, we are doing this, right? But we don't know if it's really making a difference. Uh, and so and it's because we don't have the rigorous measurement practices in place. So measurement debt breaks these loops, right? Earlier we talked about the intervene, measure, learn uh, loop. And if, if that loop is active, it will be great. It will accelerate learning. It will give you, you know, hopefully your, your transformation will be more fruitful. But if you have measurement debt, you can't measure things. So you, it, it kind of uh, it breaks this loop. And so you're basically doing one thing after the other in the hope that it is going to make a difference, right? Without any means to verify it. So now, uh, you know, that was the, a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, reflecting on the whole process. Now I want to uh, talk about the specific uh, challenges. Uh, data extraction is something that narration uh, 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 Rakesh spent a lot of time in and without that effort, none of this would have been possible, but they are most closely familiar with this. So I'll again uh, request uh, Naresh to talk about this. Cool. I mean, data extraction sounds uh, awesome, right? <laughs> uh, you know, with with data extraction comes its own set of challenges, right? Uh, the the very first one that one can imagine if you're trying to pull uh, all this kind of like lots of these different kinds of data. Uh, unfortunately, most tools don't give you one ready uh, query or API that you can just call and get all of this data. Uh, you'd have to be making, in our case, we were making, I think now we are up to about, uh, you know, 10,000, uh, you know, we were about 10,000. Now, I think we're close to 100,000 uh, API calls we are making and trying to stitch this data together. And uh, it's not as simple as just stitching the data together. Uh, if we click on the next thing, uh, Sriram, uh, we also, in many cases, uh, have to perform complex uh, data transformation steps to then uh, aggregate this data and uh, reshape the data to be able to uh, present that. Uh, and once we have that, uh, you know, you might think, okay, you've got it, but you know, only to realize that uh, you have a very low signal to uh, noise ratio and you need to discard a lot of data and only pick uh, you know, few important parameters out of the GBs of data that you pull through these API calls. 
And uh, if we go next, uh, yeah, one of the other challenges that we ran in is that across projects, uh, they, because no one was originally analyzing this data from this lens, uh, different teams ended up doing things differently, both in terms of their workflows, in terms of custom fields that they were using and so forth. And so we had to uh, really dig in uh, and pull out this data and then have a layer of uh, logic on top of it to uh, interpret this data uh you know specific to each project so a lot of uh, you can imagine configuration uh sitting saying you know for this team what data to be considered as uh, end of uh, you know deployment to a certain stage or so forth and uh one other thing as this was happening is because i think sriram also explained that you uh, start uh, you know influencing how this data is you start introducing certain inventions so the uh, intervention so the data itself keeps evolving uh, and now you have to have custom logic in your uh, extraction which uh, has to be sensitive to what time period that this data belong to and appropriately massage the data so that you can then make sense out of it so uh, again there were lots of other the things but <clears throat> i think these were the few things that top of my mind uh that i think we uh had to do uh deal with in terms of uh you know improving uh the the the, the ability to itself uh, extract the data and get it in a form where we could do analysis on top of it okay back to you sriram yeah thanks thanks naresh uh, then moving on to data availability right again like uh People do capacity planning and you know, from capacity planning, you can figure out what is the expected number of developer days and or tester days to be spent on a feature. Uh, but that might be different from the actual number of days spent, right? So um, that is where you know we'll have to come up with some additional mechanisms to obtain that kind of data. The other one is um, time spent in various queues. We talked about this, right? Most workflows don't model for wait times. And therefore, if you, if you want to start getting this data, then you have to introduce those waiting states into those workflows. And um, in teams where people multitask on features, there, you know, it's, it's hard to plan and it's uh, harder to understand what really happened actually, right? So that's where a bit of time logging might help. Like if you see in this table, we are saying uh, on, a, on, on day number six, developer spent 0 0.5 days on, 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 you know, on a task, or maybe two developers spent a quarter day each on that particular um, story, right? Whatever it is, but you know, you might need some of those um, uh, uh, data collection of that nature to 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 get to enough enough data that you can start making uh, interpreting it meaningfully with statistics uh, there are also quality challenges where for example uh, some of the things we were reliant on uh, when did this state change right like if you're calculating clt like you know the start of clt is uh, dev complete to go live and there are some other states in between so sometimes we found that uh, the state change dates are missing and how are they missing how can they miss if you have a workflow then you should not be missing the state change dates right then we realize there is an anti-pattern that uh, they are not using the dates based on the state transitions instead they have a whole bunch of custom date fields which people have to populate and if they forget to populate or they omit to populate then we will have this kind of problem in other cases, we found like bugs are not closed after fixing, or in some cases, we, we were initially puzzled by this, that we found that for some bugs, the close date is earlier than the creation date. And then we realized it's because people are cloning the bugs in when they create a new bug report, they are cloning the earlier bug report, earlier bug, and just changing the description. Now, if you clone it like that, and if you're using custom fields for your dates, then the close date also gets cloned. Right, and therefore now the creation date of the new bug is later than the close date. So all these kinds of things we slowly we had to figure out why when when we were doing these kind of things. Uh, and this is something that I already referred to that in some cases you need to have some kind of data entry discipline. Even though yes, as you know, we've all been uh, at least narration. I have been developers in the past, and we know that 
developers don't like to do any kind of manual data entry. But that is where if you explain the context and say, you know, uh, in order to continue these efforts, we need budget. In order to get budget, we have to make the case that this is actually uh, resulting is, is actually resulting in a benefit, right? Otherwise, if you don't have the budget for all these things, then basically, you know, the delivery pressures are still going to be there, and uh, you, you we will we will just have to you know soak up all that pressure, and we will not be able to invest in all these interventions, right? So if you explain it like that, it's part of a change management process then I think you can get more buy-in for the data entry discipline. So in a way, it's a, you know, don't have, it's not necessarily a bad thing. You can look at it as an additional benefit that along the way you are improving data quality and the way work is getting tracked, right? So instead of this is the textbook loop where you just say intervene, measure, learn. But in practice, what we do is we try to measure, then we find that a whole set of challenges so we either improve the processes or the tooling in order to improve the data quality. And then we are now in a position to measure. We learn from that and design our next set of interventions. And you know that becomes the uh, transformation loop in practice. That's, uh, that's pretty much what we wanted to cover to quickly you know, summarize uh, our, our key uh, points in, in conclusion. Uh, Measurement is necessary without, without measurement, transformation efforts might lose credibility, right? They might, you might get investments for a year or two. And after that, you might not get any further investments. Uh, and, uh, you know, even, even otherwise measurement is essential in order to execute. If you want to in, do data informed transformation loops, intervene, measure, learn kind of loops. Uh, but even with measurements in place, it's not a, it's not straightforward. It's not like A then B kind of inference, right? So it's not straightforward to in demonstrate the impact of our interventions, and that is where statistical methods can help. And uh, with with the right statistical methods, we can answer what factors are most influential to the metrics that matter. And then we can choose to focus on the interventions that improve those set of factors, right? And if you have sufficient data, this can be, this does not have to be done just at a whole, complete organization level. If you have enough data, you can do it on a per team basis or at least on a per, per portfolio or per line of business basis, right? Uh, and when you do this, when you when we do all of this, you will usually uncover gaps in data quality and availability. And these gaps may be addressed through a continuous improvement of uh, the processes, the workflows and the tooling. That uh, brings us to the end of you know everything that we wanted to share with you on this topic. Welcome your comments and questions. Cool. Two minutes before time. <laughs> that's that's pretty good. Uh, I've been trying to address questions along the way, so I have typed out a bunch of questions and responded already. Uh, if there are any other questions, happy to take, uh, but I hopefully have answered most of the questions along the way uh, through chat. Uh, if there's anything else, uh, let us know. I think there's some confusion around cycle time and lead time. I think I clarified that. Uh, I see Pradeep saying that he likes the last chart where we are trying to say, uh, where we are saying trying to measure, uh, you know, uh, uh, other than that, I think we've addressed most of these things. Uh, yeah, our objective, again, one of the questions was, uh, you know, are we going to share specific insights? Uh, in terms of the interventions that we did, uh, the objective was not to specifically talk about, uh, you know, this particular team, this intervention we did, because that's going to be different for different teams and different organizations. Uh, our objective here was a, a bit more meta level in some sense and trying to uh, talk about the approach that uh, you, you might want to take uh, in, in this context. I see one question has uh, popped in uh which is uh ah tom thanks for uh, asking the question uh tom is actually the guy who uh you know invented software metrics so uh it's it's great to have him here and uh i i think again tom is saying what about other critical uh, measures like security and usability uh shriram you want to take a stab at this what about other measures like security and usability? Well, I guess you could uh, use the same process, right? Like what is your measure of 
at a, at a top level, for example, right? What is the measure of uh, security, right? Somebody might say, uh, you know, based on number of incidents, right? And you might have some say, some sort of weighted score for your incidents, right? And you come up with a, use some kind of weighting logic and say, okay, in the last quarter, our security score was this much, right? So you have a measure at the top. And then you try to figure out the contributing factors. What are the, you know, like build a contribution tree like we did for security, right? And figure out what are the low level interventions that ultimately kind of bubble up and make a difference at the top, right? And so basically you can, yeah, I think the same kind of method can be applied for other, we just need to figure out what is the metric that matters and how it breaks down into a contribution tree. And we need to have the data uh, to do the regression analysis. Yeah, also, I, I don't think we are saying that, uh, you know, these things can be, uh, you know, just bolted on at the end. Uh, of course, our objective is to uh, try and build this in into the whole thought process and improve it. But given you are starting with an organization at a certain point in time, uh, what are the kinds of interventions that you would want to introduce so that eventually these things, uh, let it be security, let it be usability, other critical uh, aspects that influence uh, the, the, you know, the, the product itself uh, is, is actually uh, baked in, is, it's weaved in or built in to, to what people are doing. Uh, you know, it could be right from, uh, I think, Tom, you've talked a lot about uh, just improving the quality of uh, verifying the quality of the uh, requirement itself, right? Is, is the requirement itself of good quality or not? Uh, and so, you know, certainly some of those thought process can be uh, built in, uh, you know, uh, but where do you start with and where do you try to move the needle uh, is, I guess, how we were approaching this uh, saying, you know, how do you build, uh, identify the metric, then build the uh, contribution tree, and then slowly introduce the interventions and keep measuring whether what you're doing is helping you move in the right direction or not. Uh, because all of these things are not going to be overnight change in any organization. They will, uh, you know, and every, uh, every intervention will also have side effects. Uh, and if we are not measuring holistically, you may be uh, driving off the cliff saying you're going really fast, right? But, but you might be just driving off the cliff or in the wrong direction. So I think uh, the, the point here is that the, how do you establish this kind of a thought process where you can use this continuous uh, learning that comes from measuring the data and being data informed, uh, at least if not data driven? Yes. I yes. hope that answers uh, your question, Tom. I know we're uh, out of time, uh, but uh, we're happy to uh, pop into the Hangout area and uh, you know, happy to answer more questions and maybe even show some of the other stuff uh, that we've been doing uh, if anyone's interested. Mm -hmm.